Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is a compelling conversation. We actually had them on, uh, but by popular demand, we asked them to stay there. We just keep taping. Uh, Julie Reginsky is Democratic strategist, president of Optimist Communications. Mike Duhane, Republican strategist, partner at Mercury. Also check them out on NJ.com and the Star Ledger. Their weekly column called Friendly Fire. Mike, I'm going to pick this up. We ended our le when we saw each other last. Um, Julie was talking about media. And I asked the question about divided media, polarized media. Mike, we in the media, A, are we as polarized as the American public appears to be? And B, what responsible role should we have in promoting a more healthy democracy, if you will? Mike Duhame. It's a bit of a chicken and egg, right? I think the media is giving people what they want, but they're also feeding it. As Julie said, your Facebook algorithm is giving you people who are just like you. So if you want, you can go all day only hearing from one side. It's up to us as consumers of media also to make sure where if you're watching Fox, maybe you're also reading the New York Times or clicking on MSNBC once in a while, and certainly PBS and NPR, things that will give you kind of a wider variety of opinions and issues. Uh, but also, it's a, it's a larger fundamental question about the American electorate right now. Um, politicians are not getting rewarded for compromise right now. I mean, look what's happened really in the last, I would say, 10 to 12 years, going back to the 2010 election. Uh, the federal government, Republicans came in with really an obstructionist agenda and were rewarded for it. President Obama did not work with them at all during 2009 and passage of Obamacare. Republicans came in. And since then, I feel like the parties have just drifted even further apart. And to a point now where you don't get rewarded for compromise, look at somebody like a Jeff Flake in Arizona who was critical of Donald Trump. He left rather than face a primary. We are at a, we're at a point now, and I believe it is somewhat in both parties. I think the Democrats will see it now. I'm curious to see how West Virginia conservative Democrat Joe Manchin works with the more socialist Democratic wing of the House, right? You're getting to a point where the, the polls of both parties are punishing you for compromising uh, with somebody from the other party as opposed to rewarding you. From 2010 to 2020, we saw that in Republican primaries. If you were someone who's known as compromising, you were pushed out during primaries. And I fear that's where we're at. Until we have people rewarded by the voters for that, uh, of course, we're just going to continue in this cycle. Yeah, yeah, but Julie, isn't the problem, the conundrum, as Mike lays this out, that as we continue to face, try to face this COVID-19 crisis moving into 2021, where this will be seen, that Mike says that's what the public wants, or at least they reward you for it. But the public does want Democrats and Republicans to come together and come with a coherent COVID federal policy, state policy. So is it the government we deserve or do we, deserve, do, do we actually deserve better than what we reward people for? I don't even know what that question means, but you, yeah, I think you know. We got it. We got it, Steve. I don't know that I agree. I don't know that I agree with your premise. I think Mike is right. right. I don't know that this is what people want. Um, if that's what they wanted, they would have voted either for Joe Biden and a, and a much more... Um, robust Democratic majority in the House and certainly a, a Democratic majority in the Senate, or they would have voted for Donald Trump and the other way around. But they don't it's know what they... Uh, Julie, I'm sorry for interrupting, but do you believe that, that the say the Republicans keep control of the Senate, there's, as we do this, there's two races in Georgia, we understand, Democrats control the House, Joe Biden's the president. Do you think that most Americans are saying, yeah, I want gridlock? That's not what they were voting for. I think they were. I mean, I, I hate to say this, but look at Maine. Maine's a great example. How is it that Maine overwhelmingly votes for um, votes for Joe Biden and then has, a, I believe, an 18-point swing to keep Susan Collins in the Senate? I mean, how is that possible? And so the answer is, yeah. I mean, I do think people want, uh, they consider it to be compromised in the sense that they want, maybe they're voting to have both parties work together. But after all these years, as Mike pointed out, after the last uh, probably 30 years from when Newt Gingrich got in in 94, do they really think that there's much compromise to be had between a executive from one side of the aisle and a Congress from the other side of the aisle? It's not cooperation, it's gridlock. And maybe that's what they want. Maybe they want no government at all. I really in the really midst really of a global point. pandemic? Go ahead, Mike. I, I think Apparently. it really brings up a really good point. I think, I think voters want checks and balances. I think they don't want... They, I, I think the, the middle of the electorate right now does not love either party. And the way to check both parties is to make sure there's divided government. And I think there's been there have been votes for a divided government now. You've also had rejectionist change elections going all the way back to 2006. It seems like every two years, voters are throwing everybody out. And it's been an angry electorate since 2006. And what they want is the parties to work together. But what they really don't want is one party running the whole show. And that's what but, they but, don't want to show us. 
But move, by the way, there's a, a wonderful sounding dog somewhere in there. It, it might be in my own house, but um, or worse, yeah, it could be in my head. But here's <laughs> here's the question: COVID, institutional structural racism, um, environmental problems, global warming, um, the economy, etc. Real public policy issues. We're less interested in partisan politics, and both of you care deeply about public policy. So, Julie, my question is this. What you and Mike just described that you cl clearly agree on, what voters seem to have wanted in this past November election, what does it mean about solving some of those problems or at least making progress? Doesn't it mean de facto? We're not doing anything. Actually, think about what you just, the, the issues you just outlined, COVID. A great chunk of this country believes COVID is a hoax. They believe that it's basically something that's being driven to tear down the economy so that Donald Trump would lose. How there many people would have to die or be hospitalized for people to go, oh, I guess it's real? There was an interesting article um, where a nurse in South, just this past week, where I saw a, nurse, that. a nurse in South Dakota was saying that as people are dying from COVID, as they're putting ventilators down their throat, they're effectively saying, this is all a hoax. This is all being done. Screw Joe Biden. I mean, you think about what, what is being said, global warming. You have a Republican party that frankly rejects global warming as a real thing, a lot of people in the party. Um, racial, you said there, there's, there, there's, there's racial unrest. There's, there's racial strength. Well, excuse me. I had State Senator Mike Doherty on. Right. About an hour before we taped this, he said institutional racism does not exist, and we need to stop perpetuating that hoax. There, there, so there you go. So there you go. You have people like Senator Doherty who don't believe it exists or, and, and I'm not going to speak for him, or believe that, yes, it exists, but it oppresses the poor white working class because they apparently can't get into Harvard. And meanwhile, anybody who's, you know, African-American in their mind skates in. So when you think about what we don't agree, we don't even, we're not even reading from the same book. We're not even speaking the same language. Are it's there not any facts we can agree on? Are there any facts, objective facts we can agree on? You know, I used to think we could agree on something like COVID. I used to think that if there was a 9-11 style, um, some sort of 9-11 style event, that we would all come together the way we did after 9-11. COVID was that 9-11 style I event. I thought so. It was that chance. It was Mike, that chance. Can we, Mike, can we agree on anything? I was, I think, uh, Julian, I agree all the time, as you can see. I do believe uh, <laughs> COVID was this generation, September 11th. There's going to be a a pre and a post. There are things you remember that were different before and, and never uh, to be seen again. And it was a great opportunity for Donald Trump as the president to bring people together because governors needed him. The go governors need the federal government in a time of crisis. Look at some of the nice things Andrew Cuomo and Phil Murphy said about Donald Trump during the height of this pandemic. They needed his support. And to some extent, the federal government was being helpful. Think of what he could have done. Just think of the political strategy, no less the actual good policy, if he had worked with the Democratic governors of Michigan of Wisconsin, of Pennsylvania, very important battleground states for him, where he could have done the right thing from a policy point of view and actually had a benefit from a political point of view. Can Joe Biden do that with Republican governors, Mike? I think Joe Biden probably can because he's a creature of the Senate. He grew up he grew up in the Senate, right? He was 29 years old when he got elected. But this is somebody who has lived that bipartisan approach and actually has a relationship. I don't know how good, but he actually has one with Mitch McConnell. He actually has one with a number of Republican senators. So my hope is they'll be able to work together. Ultimately, it is incumbent upon upon the executive to reach out. One of the, I remember one of the stories after Republicans took control in 2010, it, it had been said that John Boehner, who was then the minority leader, had never visited with President uh, Obama in the White House or on Air Force One. The president is the one who's got great home field advantage and can reach out. I think if the president invites Republican senators over to the White House and brings them in and makes them part of it, they're not going to reject that. Now, listen, they have their own politics back home to worry about, but it's ultimately- okay. President. President Trump didn't do it. I think President Biden has the opportunity. Whether or not he'll be successful, I don't know, but he has the opportunity. All right. You mind if I plug again your column? Sure. Go for it. It's called Friendly Fire um, with Julie and Mike. Check them out every Sunday on the Star Ledger and also on NJ.com. I wish we had more folks in public life, be they elected or not, that have civil discourse, even when they disagree, and even though they couldn't give me any silver lining in these discussions. Julie Reginsky. <laughs> Mike Duhame, thank you, my friends. Best thank to you, you and your so family. Much. Bye, Julie. Yeah. I'm Steve Adubato. Thanks for watching. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting Reimagine Child Care, TD Bank, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, 
PSENG, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, Seton Hall University, Summit City, MD, and by ADP. Promotional support provided by CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, and by NJ.com. This is the Seton Hall story, one that comes to life every day on our campus. This is the place where great minds discover, innovate, collaborate, and find their true calling. This is the place where passion has a purpose, where learning inspires leading. The bonds we make, the values we teach, inspire our community to take heart and take action. This is Seton Hall University. This is what great minds can do.